Here we are. We're in John chapter 21. We're going to begin at verse 1. We're going to read to verse 14. And then we'll pick up after we do those verses in verse 15 and move on to the conclusion of our study. So beginning in John chapter 21 at verse, at verse 1. John writes, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he had, raised, had been raised from the dead. And so what we're going to be looking at uh, tonight as we continue and conclude our study in the uh, Gospel of John is we're going to see that chapter 21 was written with two purposes in mind, and you'll see this clearly in just a moment. One of the purposes is to record the restoration of the Apostle Peter, because we remember that the Apostle Peter had denied knowing Jesus Christ. And so one of the reasons that we find chapter 21 was written is to record the restoration of the apostle. And secondly, it's going to be to, to, to uh, correct an error concerning John. And the error, you'll see that error in uh, verses 20 through 23, uh, uh, a rumor that had gone out concerning him. And we'll see that in just a moment. And so as we're about to look into this, let's lay a foundation. We know that the apostle Peter had boasted that he would never deny Jesus. He had even gone so far as to tell the Lord, I will even die for you. In John chapter 13, we saw in verses 36 through 38, how it says that Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? And he went on to say this. He said, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. I will lay down my life for you, the apostle had said. So later that evening, Jesus had been taken to the home of a man by the name of Annas, and he had been interrogated. And Peter and John had been granted entrance into a courtyard. And while well, Peter and uh, John were there when they had entered in, when Peter was there, he denied the Lord. He denied Jesus three times. Now Luke gives us a little insight into what had happened after Peter denied him the final time, because Luke tells us in chapter 22, verses 61 and 62, that after he denied him, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Luke tells us Peter went out and he wept bitterly. We begin by acknowledging a very simple thing that we need to acknowledge. Peter is still dealing with his failure. And we're going to be seeing how the Lord ministers to the ones who have failed. We will be looking at, in a moment, the restoration of his beloved apostle. So as we begin, verses 1 and 2 tell us that Jesus is in northern Israel. 
It's interesting that you have here the in verse 1, the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is also the Lake of Gennesaret. It's also uh, the Sea of Galilee. It's known by different names. That's where he's at. He's there by the uh, Sea of Galilee. Now, a command had been given to them by an angel through uh, Mary Magdalene. In Mark 16, it says in verses 6 and 7, he said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So he had told the angel said, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Peter is already being singled out. But they were, they were told that they would see him in Galilee. That's where they are right now. They're in Galilee. They're at the Sea of Tiberias. And the center of this story is going to be the Apostle Peter. And so as this is taking place here, it says that he's there, verse 2, he's there with several of the other apostles and all. And in verse 3, he speaks. And in verse 3 says, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we hope you drown. No, they said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now, what's happening here? Simon Peter is returning to his old life, the life of a fisherman. All the way back in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18, and 18 through 20, we have the call of the apostle Peter, who was a fisherman. And so this passage gives us insight into his influence, the influence that the apostle Peter wielded over the others. Now he's making a statement here. Notice with me again in verse 3 when he simply says, I'm going fishing. What provoked him to return to this old occupation? What provoked the apostle Peter to return to his old life, if you will? And there are various questions that people have asked. There are various things that they have said related to this. Uh, was it impatience? And Jesus hadn't appeared. He got restless. Did he forget his commission? Jesus said in chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, given them, he had given them an, a, a commission. Did he forget that commission so quickly? Did he have practical concerns like making a living, taking care of his family? We don't know. All we know is that he decided to go to work. And we know that as he made the decision, his friends followed his lead. They also got into a boat. They also went to work, and they went to work, some of them at their old occupations. They were fishermen. And this is what happens. The, the influence that the apostle Peter wields is still very strong. And it says in verse 3, it says they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night, notice, they caught nothing. You might want to underscore the words, they caught nothing. Because when you're not obeying the Lord, all of your pursuits bear no fruit. And it doesn't just affect you, by the way. When you're not obeying the Lord, it affects you, but it also affects your friends. And it also affects your families. When I, as a believer who have influence with others, when I'm not exercising my influence for good, then I have a tendency of influencing others away from where they should be going. And the Apostle Peter has a tremendous amount of influence, but the influence that's being wielded in the simple statement, I'm going to go fishing, the influence is to drag them back into their old life. And so as this is taking place, it says in verse 3, they went out, immediately got into the boat. That night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They were apparently far enough out to not be able to make him out in the dim light. And they didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. 
So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Think about that one for just a moment. How big is the boat? It's not that big. If it's the size of the boat that we get on when we're at the Sea of Galilee and traveling across it, it's, it's good size, it's bigger than a rowboat, but it's not a battleship. So it's probably, I can't remember, I'm not good at distances, but it's probably from one side to the other as far as being wide. It may be about 20 feet wide or so, about 20 feet. So does that make sense to you? And I'm sure I have some fishermen in this room right now. You're in a boat, it's 20 feet. You've been dropping your nets, we'll say, on the left side. And uh, somebody says, well, throw it on the other side. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, 20 feet away, you're going to, I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, Fishermen, uh, th that's kind of a joke in some ways. you got to be kidding me. You're telling me there's going to be a school of fish on the opposite side of this boat. But that's what Jesus says. Do you have any food? And, of course, they're saying no. He, he, in essence, he's saying, you've been busy laboring all night. Do you have any fruit from your labor? And their answer is no. So that's when he says, cast the net on the right side. You're going to find some. Now, what does that really mean? Obey me. Obey me, and you will bear fruit. Listen, by obeying him, even when not totally understanding his reasons, will result in blessings. Something to always remember is his ways will always be mysterious to us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's different. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him. He will direct thy paths. Don't lean unto your own understanding. There are times when the Lord has something prepared for you that you simply don't know is there. And so what he's saying is, I simply want you to move into this area because when you're in this area, that's where I'm going to meet you. It's a simple act of obedience. You have your nets. You've dropped them on one side of the boat. Drop them on the other side. How difficult is that? But man's pride, being what it is, might resist such a command. These men didn't. And so they simply obeyed a simple command. And I'm telling you, and some of you know exactly what I mean, there are times when the Lord may move you in a certain way to a certain place, to do something that doesn't seem to make any sense. But in the midst of all of that, he shows up in a special way. And that becomes one of the memories that you cling to when you begin to realize how God met you and how God moved in your life. And that's what's taking place here. They didn't understand all the reasons, but by obedience, a simple obedience to the simple command, there was a blessing. And so it says in verse 7, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. So this disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, it may be that, that there was a, a memory of what had taken place that was recorded in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 5, where early on in the ministry, Jesus was there and he was at the Sea of Galilee, and, and the Apostle Peter and, and some of the men were there uh, after a night of fishing, and, and a whole multitude of people had surrounded Christ, and they wanted to hear him as he, he brought forth the word. And because there were so many, he turned to the Apostle Peter, and he said to Peter, he said, um, I want to use your boat, cast out a little bit from the shore so I can speak. And, uh, and so Peter, you know, willingly, willingly did that. And, and we know the story. We know how Jesus was there and he ministered. And then he turns to the apostle Peter and he says to him, um, you know, let's cast out your nets into the deep. And, and, and Peter looks at him and, and I, I love that story. The, it, you, you know, it's, it's a great story. And Peter looks at him and and, and you can almost see this great fisherman as he's looking at the master and he's trying to explain to this carpenter turned preacher uh, what fishing is all about. And he says, you know, uh, we, we've been out all night and we've dropped our nets and we've caught nothing. 
you don't drop your nets during the day when the fish can see the net coming down. It just causes the fish just to move away from the net. So we fish at night because they don't see the nets. Let me explain to you fishing 101, Jesus, you know, and, and that's how it works. And so, you know, we've been fishing and laboring all night and we've caught nothing. But this is where it's beautiful and it's something to learn. You can see this in, in Luke 5, 1 through 11, but it's when he says, nevertheless, at your word. And he dropped the nets. And when he drops the net, the nets are so full, and you can see the excitement taking place on the ship as they're pulling in this heavy catch of fish. And that's when the apostle Peter looked at Jesus, and it seems that it was one of those moments when he realized this is not just a, a, a carpenter turned preacher. This is something greater than that. And that's when he looks at him and he says, Lord, de depart from me. I'm a wicked man. He, he saw himself when he saw Jesus is what happens. And Depart from me, I'm a wicked man. He saw himself. And maybe this is helping them because it may be reminding them of how Jesus had done that before. Cast out your nets, you'll catch a draft of fish. And oh my, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Well, as this is taking place, I mean, it says in verse 8, the other disciple came in the little boat. They were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. A cubit is usually measured at 18 inches. Well, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And though, although there were so many, the net was not broken. And so this, there's so much here that you could see, and I'm not going to touch on, but a couple of things that I'd like to point out here. He says in verse 11 that Peter dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. Peter dragged it. It doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to indicate that there were others helping him. And if he did this alone, can you imagine how much weight that would have been, 153 fish? And so that's why people, when they refer, commentators will speak of Peter this way. They'll say that burly fisherman, you know, thick. He was thick. Why do they say that? Well, I can't pull in 153 goldfish. <laughs> and this, <laughs> these were large fish. And so he dragged them up to land. And second thing, one of our, one of our guides pointed this out. He said, do you know there's a significance to the number 153? And when we were in Israel, one of our guides was saying that. He said, during the time of Christ, that's how many nations they believed were in the world, 153 nations. And so what you're getting a picture of is Peter becoming once again a fisher of men, going to all the nations to bring them to saving knowledge of Christ. That's what we're going to be looking at in just a moment. And so as this is taking place here, Jesus, I want you to see this in when it says in verse 10, when he said, bring some of the fish we, which you just caught. I want you to notice Jesus provided for them, but they added to what they had been given. They added to it from his increase because we only give back what we've received. One of the scriptures that I like, and there's so many, but this one's Romans 11.35. You might want to remember it. There's a question, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Who has first given to him that he owes you anything in return? All I've ever been able to give to God is out of the substance he's already provided for me. It already belongs to him. The cattle on a thousand hills, everything belongs to him. And so all you ever do when you give to the Lord is give to him that which already belongs to him. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said it like this. Uh, who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So Simon Peter went and he dragged this, this net to land. It's filled with large fish. 
He brings it, and uh, in his fleshly effort, he's strong enough to drag a heavy net, but spiritually, he's become unable to fish for one man. And so as he's there, in verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and, and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So Jesus is still giving them the example of service. There he is serving them. And this, by the way, gave, uh, left a great impression on the apostle Peter, because in Acts chapter 10, verses 40 and 41, the apostle said, Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And verse 14 says, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised. When he says this is the third time, this is the third time recorded in the book of John. You see it in John 20, verse 19, chapter 20, verse 26, and then here. And so now we begin to move into the restoration of the apostle Peter. Verse 15, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. We'll spend some time now looking at restoration. Because this section is a section in John's gospel that deals with that subject. This section deals with the Apostle Peter's restoration to fellowship with Jesus and service to the Lord. The word restoration, it's a word that we use. We speak about that when we're talking about furniture that's been restored and all. Restoration speaks of bringing something back to its original condition. And what we're having here is the story about Jesus restoring the Apostle Peter to full fellowship with himself. He's restoring him to original condition. So in viewing the passage, we get insight into how the Lord ministers to us, how the Lord, our shepherd, cares for us. Remember in Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3, how it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. The word restores in the Hebrew, he refreshes, he repairs my soul. Your soul cannot be repaired through any human agency. I want you to, I want you to know this. I, I want every believer in this room to understand this tonight. You cannot be talked in just, just through conversation. You cannot be talked into health. You can, be given, you can be given great insight. You can be given great wisdom from people. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit, united with the Word of God, received by faith to have a refreshed soul. That refreshed soul comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the purpose of the church today, as it has always been, is to bring the word of refreshment to thirsty souls. So we can create a climate of morality. And I believe that a climate of morality that's good is a, is a good climate. I would prefer having uh, uh, cities that are filled with goodness <laughs> much more than cities that are filled with evil. All of us agree to that. 
But goodness in and of itself is not salvation. And sometimes, and I'm, I'm going to be real with you guys, you know, I'll be gone for a week, you can get over it. I, I, I get concerned for the church in this day because it seems to me that the church is forgetting the message of the gospel is to restore souls. And it seems to me that sometimes we're sidetracked to try and restore America. I want America to be restored. God knows I do. All of us do. I love the United States. I loved it enough to volunteer for the draft to go into the military and serve my, my country. I love my country. I don't think anybody would ever think I don't. But the country needs more than moral goodness. Guys, don't forget this. The country needs Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. In all the goodness that we do, I'm I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be not careful, but clear. The thing that concerns me is I really suspect that, that we're, we're the church is in danger of trying to reform America instead of bringing America to Christ. And that concerns me because we're busy, busy, and I think we should be concerned. And, and that's why I'm trying to be careful I think we, sh we, we should be concerned about all the issues that we're concerned about. But I've also seen that the more we hear about the evil, the angrier we get at evil people. And the angrier I get at evil people, the less love I'm going to have for them. And sometimes even the less, less willingness I might have to go out of, of my way to try and win them to cry. I'm telling you, I'm concerned for our nation right now because we're, we're moving to try and create an artificial goodness. And I think the church sometimes forgets that, that, that we are salt, yes. We are light, yes. We make our, our voices known, and in this country, we're capable of doing that in a variety of ways, including our vote. And I think every believer ought to vote. I believe that with all of my heart. We ought to vote. I vote. I vote at every election. I vote because it's my moral obligation. I want to vote. I do vote. So I'm not opposing that. And, and I'm trying to be careful because I don't talk about this subject. And, and, and there's reasons for it. I just want to be careful to remember that a soul is restored not by moral laws. A soul is restored by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God and cultures are transformed, not by bringing in, you know, great presidents or, you know, great Supreme Court justices. Thank God for those things. And I believe we need those things. And I don't want to be misunderstood. And I think that what we're going to see is we're going to see a huge battle. That's going to, it's already starting. There's so much anger out there and there's so much intimidation. And, uh, and I know that. We all know that. I'm not saying something we're not aware of. And if Trump should win again, just be ready. Because if all of this anger for four years has been built up to this moment, it's going to continue, I would think, into the next four. I'm trying to be careful not to go into political things with you, not because I can't, but because I want to be careful to make sure I'm clear with what I'm trying to say. We're looking for a revival. We sang this today. Revival is an awakening. The nation can't be revived because unbelievers are dead. It's the church that's revived. It's the church that's awakened because we're alive in Christ. Before you're born again, Ephesians chapter 2, go home and read it if you'd like, it's very clear, speaks concerning those who don't know Christ are dead in their trespasses and sins. They're spiritually dead. So it's like me trying to get a corpse to do good things. They're spiritually dead. Revival is when the church wakes up, comes back to life. So the question has to be, what is a revival? We, we sang about it tonight, bring revival. It's simply the awakening of the church to the first things. And what are the first things? Come back to the first things. The things that we did when we first got saved, worship the Lord, serve Jesus Christ, loved him with all of our heart. The first things, got into his word, prayed, 
shared his gospel, the first things, walked in the spirit, manifested the gifts of the Lord. Those are the first things, served him with all of our hearts. And that's what he wants us to do. When the church awakens to that, the church is reviving, is awakening. But the thing that brings that reviving is not political rallies. It's the gospel. It's the message of transformed lives. And the culture is transformed, not because we have great judges and a great president, we'll say, or a great cabinet or whatever. It, 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 the, 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 the culture is changed because the people who make up the culture are transformed. And the people in the culture who are transformed are transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit, the renewing of their mind, according to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, as they offer themselves living sacrifices to God. And so the transformation takes place as God washes us by his blood. Our minds are cleansed. Our lives are changed. The culture is transformed. And it's not because we did something physically. It's because God did something spiritually. And so with the apostle Peter, he's received a commission. Jesus already breathed on him, said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they've retained. They're retained of them. What's that mean? He's already given him a commission, and yet he has to restore him because the apostle Peter is there eating a meal at a, at a fi around a fire, and it's got to be tense. Have you ever had a problem with one of your brothers or sisters, some of you love very much, maybe your dad or your mom for that matter, or maybe granny, your grandma, and it's Thanksgiving? And you show up and you, and you tell you, I'll, I'll take it from a male perspective. You need to tell your wife, you know what? My brother's mad at me. It's going to be tense at the table. It's going to be tense at the table. And she says, well, you know, it ought to be. You're a punk. No, she says, you got to deal with it. And have you ever done anything like that? I know all of us, it's, it's human. You know, there's something between us. Let's talk it out. We've got to talk it out. We can't just let it separate us. We got to talk it out. But you're there at the table and, and, and everybody's aware that there's, there's, you know, there's a problem here. I, I, I see in my mind's eye the Apostle Peter there, he's eating at a, at a eating, you know, eating some fish with the guys and Jesus. And Jesus breaks the silence. Peter. <laughs> but notice how, and I want to develop this with you. Again, in verse 15, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Jesus breaks the silence. Now, this isn't the first time that Peter's been in contact with the Lord. He'd already seen the Lord on a couple of occasions. But with all the activity that's going on, he's living with the knowledge of his denial. He is spiritually active, but he has unfinished business. He's got a wound, and this wound hasn't been healed. And if that wound isn't healed, he'll never be fully used. You see, there, there was a, an open failure. There was an open denial. And because of this, there needs to be an open confession and an open restoration. Peter had sinned in full view of witnesses. And because he had, as a leader, that sin has to be dealt with openly because everybody's aware of it. Later on in 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20, Paul said, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses, and those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. The sin was open, the rebuke is open. Again, only three weeks or so earlier, he had denied Christ, and Peter hadn't forgotten his own words. Though all were to forsake you, I never will. I will die for you. So he hasn't forgotten what he had said, and, and there's no doubt in his mind they're being replayed. These words are haunting him. It, it's like when King David was writing concerning his moral failure with Bathsheba in Psalm 51 when he said in verses 1 through 4, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, 
According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. My sin, David said, is ever before me. You see, sin can't be swept under the carpet and forgotten. It can't be excused. It can't be renamed. Sin isn't something you ignore. It remains with you. It haunts you. It accuses you. You can't deny its existence by saying others do the same thing, therefore it's okay. You can't call it a mistake, a, an error, a mental lapse, a culturally acceptable action. You can't blame it on your parents or your friends or boss circumstances, the government. You can't rename it. You can't call it a disease, a preference. You can't legalize it. It's still a sin to be healed and to have peace and restoration. Sin must be brutally dealt with. It needs to be recognized. It needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be named. It needs to be confessed. It needs to be repented of. And it needs to be forsaken. And when that happens, restoration to God and restoration with others is possible. You see, Peter's restored to fellowship with Jesus. And then he's going to be restored to his ministry. And there Jesus is making this meal. He has his disciples with him. It's been eaten, like I mentioned a moment ago, probably in uncom uncomfortable silence. Peter had led the disciples back to their former occupations. They've been fishing. The tension must be growing. They're there quietly with the Lord, alone on the shore. But Jesus, in verse 15, breaks the silence. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? More than these what? Do you love me more than these things, more than fishing? Do you love me more than your boat? Do you love me more than your business? No. Do you love me more than you love your friends? Mm, no. I don't think he's asking that. I think he's saying, do you love me more than these other men love me? Because that's what you said. You said they'll all deny me, yet you never would. You said you would die for me. And the words of Christ, by the way, and let me say this very briefly. When Jesus is speaking, do you picture him screaming at him, yelling at him, foaming at the mouth at him, angry at him? You don't see any evidence of that at all, do you? You see him speaking softly and gently to him because, frankly, that's how the Holy Spirit normally works with the gentleness. And as he's asking this question, do you love me more than, than these? Do you love me more than the others? It must have, must have torn into Simon's heart because he had insisted he loved Jesus more than them. So what do we find here? Well, we find that Jesus is stirring two memories that Peter would have had. One, perhaps... He thought of when Jesus called him and had given him a promise. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 42, he had said, Simon, your new name is Cephas, which means a stone. But it also reminds him of a denial because he had said he loved Jesus but denied him. And those two memories would encompass, like bookends, Peter's life with Jesus Christ. And as he thinks on those things, He's being gently brought to a place of restoration. Notice again, I want you to see this. Jesus speaks of him and calls him Simon, son of Jonah. That gives you insight into what's going on. Simon bar Jonah is what he originally was known as. The word Simon, the name Simon, means the one who hears or the one who listens. It's a fairly common name. But what is interesting is that he is Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar-Jonah speaks of being the son of. Uh, Jesus spoke of him in that way in the past. When Jesus was there in Caesarea Philippi, and, and he was with his men, and he began to speak to him, make, speak to them. It's found in Matthew 16, uh, verses 13 through 17, how Jesus was there and in this area, Caesarea Philippi, and, and, and they're together, 
as Jesus says, uh, who, who, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. So he already knew, Jesus knew that, that these people were, were, were speaking about him. Herod had been making some comments about him, and the word has come to Christ. He knows these things. So how are you being infected by these things? What, what are you thinking now that you're hearing that people are saying that I'm these people? Who do, you, who do men say that I am? Because you're going to be influenced by, by the things they say about me because my disciples always are going to be affected by what the world says. So who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, you're John, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Then he said, you know the story, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father. This is, this is a heavenly revelation. You didn't find this by just seeking it out. God had to reveal this knowledge to you, but he called them Simon, son of Jonah. Now, after saying that, he said, You're Peter, and upon this rock, this confession, I will build my church. Well, I find it interesting that he refers to him, Simon, son of Jonah here. Why? Well, all you need to do is ask yourself a question. Who was Jonah? Now, it was his father, obviously, but is there another Jonah in the Bible? And obviously there is. What is Jonah known for? Jonah is the prophet who tried to run away from his ministry. Simon, son of Jonah. Simon, Cephas, Rock, you're trying to run away from your ministry. In your denial and in your shame, you're forgetting who you are and you're going back to your old occupation, fishing. When I said to you, I will make you to be a fisher of men, you're going back to fishing for fish. Simon, you need to be restored because there's something greater than having a business that is profitable. 153 fish is a lot of fish. There's something better than being profitable. It's reaching, fishing for men, catching them alive and setting them free. Simon, son of Jonah, don't run from your ministry. Don't run from your calling. Don't run from what I called you to. I wonder if I have any Simon bar Jonas in this room right now or any who are watching right now. God called you to use you and you're running, going back to the old life one step at a time through disappointment or denial, some failure, where the Lord could speak to you right now and say, Simon bar Jonah, why are you running? How far do you think you can go? Simon, Jesus could say, I came and sought you out when you were going back. I'm on the shore looking for you. You weren't looking for me. I prepared a meal for you. You brought some fish, but I already had prepared some. You're only giving to me something that I've already given to you. And Simon, you need to understand who you are. You've been called. You are a rock, and the confession that you confess, that's what I build my church on, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Simon, you're a preacher of grace. You've got to receive it yourself. So when I read this story, I, I do not see Jesus angry at Simon. I see Jesus fishing for a fisherman, bringing him back. He's reminding him of his original call. He's rem reminding him also gently of the failure. But Jesus is meeting him where he is, and he's confronting him. But he exposes him only to heal the pain that he's suffering, that he might restore him. So he says it, Simon, do you love me? Now, Simon is a man whose pride has been dealt with. And so Jesus begins to ask him, now when it says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? The word love, those of, all of you probably already know this, but in the original language, 
The word love there is the highest form. It's called agape. Do you love me? Do you have agape for me? Do you love me more than in anything? Do you have that sacrificial love for me? Do you love me more than these? And he says, you know that I love you. The word that Peter uses is not the word agape when he responds. The word Peter uses is the, a, a, a softer version of love. It's the phileo, which speaks of a deep companionship, a friendship love, a brotherly love. And so Jesus is saying, do you have an intense, passionate, self-sacrificial love for me, Peter? Because you said you did. Do you? You know that I have a phileo for you. I can't say that I have that agape, that self-sacrifice, and I can't. I've already failed. And then he says to him, oh, feed my lambs. Take care of my little ones. Then he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you agape me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I have phileo for you. Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now notice Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? You know why he was grieved? Because the third time Jesus used the word phileo. Twice before, do you have agape? Do you have agape? This time, do you have phileo? That grieves the apostle Peter. Because Jesus is meeting him where he's at, but he knows that where he's at isn't where he's supposed to be. But you know what? Peter, now how many times did you deny me? Three times. And Peter, how many times did I ask you if you loved me and then commission you? Three times. For every denial, there's a restoration. You denied me three times, and I've restored you three times. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my lambs. And by the way, you can. Now, here's something for you. Here's a little spiritual thing. You can feed them, and you can care for them because you're broken. The one that God will use in ministry is the broken one. The most valuable vessel in the hands of the master is the broken one. His sin had been great, but Jesus' forgiveness is greater. Psalm 51, 12, and 13, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way. Sinners shall be converted to you. And he brings them back. He restores them. There needs to be an awareness of who you are what you have done, a rejection of those things, a repentance, and then the restoration comes. And Jesus is saying, you denied me, but now I'm recommissioning you. You have been restored. Your sin is forgiven you. One of the things that I'll say, and then we're going to close in a moment here, is I don't, I don't, I, the, the Lord the Lord deals with sin, but he, he's not the one who reminds you of it. He exposes it so you can confess it and forsake it, but I'm trying to find a way to say this. When, when my kids were young and they did something wrong, we would sit and have a conversation, and when they would come to the point of saying, I was wrong, Dad, forgive me. I would say to them, this conversation's over. It's over. This will not be brought up again. It's done. And I don't bring it up to this day. To this day. Once we're reconciled, I don't bring it back up. You know, some things need to just remain under the blood. Why bring it up and remind? You know, I love a quotation by Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Val Graham, when she said, every cat knows that some things need to remain buried. Think about that one for a minute. Every cat knows that some things need to remain buried. Your sins are under the blood of Christ. You're not supposed to go back and dig them back up again and look at them again. They're taken care of. 
Go forward because God has restored you. He's not going to be reminding him. He dealt with it. It's dealt with. Move on. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my lambs. He recommissions him. And then, most assuredly, verse 18, I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So he told him, you're going to be taken and you're going to suffer martyrdom. But he said, follow me. Well, after hearing, oh, by the way, you're going to die. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, following, who had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one be who's, who betrays you? And, and Peter, seeing him, said, Lord, what about this man? Oh, I love that. I love that. And Jesus said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. If there's, if there's something that we need to learn in, 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 in our, I think, our spiritual life, guys, it's, it's uh, learn your own lessons and stop asking God about why he isn't dealing with somebody else's. You know, because we do that. You know, oh, look at me. How come I'm getting beat up by you? That guy, how come? Yeah, I want to deal with this. Lord, you okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. But what about that man? You just told me I'm going to die. What about that man? And Jesus says to him, mind your own business. That's what he's saying. Listen, I've got a work to do in you. You take care of yourself and you let me take care of him. You allow me to take care because what is that to you? You follow me. What I do in his life is of no concern to you. Mind your own business. Your call in life is to follow me. Concentrate on pursuing me and let me lead him. It's hard enough following Jesus for yourself, let alone checking on how others are doing. But some people seem to think that they can live the Christian life on behalf of somebody else. What are they doing? Where are they going? What are they saying? Why aren't they doing? And so he's saying, I'm not going to satisfy your curiosity. I'm going to rebuke you. What is that to you? I'm going to do enough in your life to keep you busy for the rest of your life. <laughs> and you need to be faithful to your own commission. And you need to mind your own business. Let me work with him in the way I do. Now notice in verse 23, the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus didn't say to him he wasn't going to die. He said, if I will let it remain till I come, what is that to you? So a rumor went out, began to fly about John. He's never going to die. They took what he said out of context. They spread this to others. And so John is correcting this rumor. And that's why he wrote that. And then finally, verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. We know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. My concluding words are simple. You can trust my testimony. As an eyewitness, he's saying, I speak emphatically of the life of Jesus Christ. And by the way, my gospel scratches the surface of what Jesus did and who Jesus is. There is so much more that you can know. And so spend your life discovering more about him. Follow him. I've discovered something, and so have you, that the more I think I've grown to understand him, the more I become aware of how little I really do. It's a lifetime pursuit. It's a lifetime of growth. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a sense of layers of experience that you have. I've learned the Lord in this way, and then he takes you a layer deeper and then a layer deeper. And then when you finally say, now I, now I get it, you die. That's kind of how it works. So did you guys enjoy the gospel of John? I sure did. Amen.